Hello again, friends. We are going to discuss a rather conspicuous syndrome here called Cornelia de Lange syndrome. Uh, this is a heterogeneous disorder that affects multiple organ systems during development. Uh, it has varying severities. However, the one thing that all, uh, all forms of the syndrome will share in common are these very distinct facial features, and that should make the diagnosis relatively apparent within the first several weeks of life uh, after the child's born. Uh, it can also affect the, and often does affect, the central nervous system, which uh, leads to intellectual disability, and can also affect the GI system, and most prominently, uh, the effects are going to be congenital diaphragmatic hernia during fetal development, uh, which of course leads to pulmonary issues, and then lifelong, these patients can struggle with reflux disease. The prevalence is estimated at 1 to 10,000. You can see anywhere in the literature of 1 to 10,000 to 1 in 30,000, so it's not terribly rare, uh, but we are believing now that this is probably an underdiagnosed syndrome, so I put here around 1 to 10,000, uh, 1 in 10,000. Uh, the male to female ratio is 1 to 1.3, which is interesting because one of the genes that causes this syndrome is X-linked, and so you would think that more males would have this because of that, uh, but indeed the, uh, this does have a female preponderance. This is Cornelia de Lange. This is the Dutch pediatrician uh, after whom this disorder is named. Uh, she discovered this uh, in, uh, in the 1930s. So there are three genes that have been identified as involved with CDLS. Uh, the most common is NIPBL, uh, which is called NIPTB, uh, NIPTB homeolog, I believe. Um, it's on the short arm of chromosome 5. Like I said, it accounts for the majority of CDLS cases, and compared to the other genes, this is going to have more severe symptoms. The other two genes are uh, SMC1A, which is found on chromosome X, and SMC3, which is found on the long arm of chromosome 10, and those are involved in around 5% of cases together. All of these genes code for components of the cohesin complex, and cohesin is a protein that binds to chromatin and uh, secures the sister chromatids during cell division. And NIPBL also has a function as a promoter gene, and so that's probably why uh, that leads to more severe consequences. NIPBL is particularly expressed in the upper extremities and in the face, and so mutation with this gene is going to be associated with the classic CDLS phenotype, which also involves abnormalities of the upper extremities, short upper extremities, uh, lack of fingers, uh, lack of the ulna or radius, and so forth. Uh, SMC1A and SMC3 mutations are associated with less severe CDLS phenotypes, um, but they typically will have those facial features. And this is due to a sporadic mutation in almost all cases, although females uh, and males uh, who are affected with this are fertile. Uh, typically, they don't go on to reproduce. It's autosomal dominant, and so you only require one error gene. So this is the cohesin complex. You don't need to know this for the test, but um, these other genes, or these other proteins that are involved, RAD21 and uh, WAPL, uh, these are candidate genes for being uh, in those minority cases where we can't link it to SMC13 or NIPBL. And it's also worth noting that uh, these genes are uh, particularly the SMC genes, um, WAPL, are also involved in colon cancer and in, uh, I believe, uterine cancer, or it might be ovarian cancer. Uh, you have to look that up. <clears throat> but they are involved in various cancers as well. The features, uh, it looks like there's a lot of them here. What I really want you to focus on, though, are the craniofacial features, uh, the fact that these children uh, are microcephalic, and also that they uh, are at risk for CDH. So typically these children have microcephaly. They will go on to be short. Uh, they can have feeding problems early on. Uh, usually that's related to reflux disease. Uh, you can see cutis marmorata, of course that's a very nonspecific uh, symptom. Craniofacially, this is where you're going to really see the most conspicuous aspects. Uh, that's really going to help you separate this out. So first off, they have a short neck. Um, 
the majority of these children uh, with these short neck will have had a cystic hygroma during fetal development. Uh, they have a low posterior hairline, hypertrichosis, so this is a big deal here. Hypertrichosis, um, these babies tend to have a lot of hair. Uh, they have hair in areas where you wouldn't expect a baby to have hair, uh, namely in between the eyebrows and the forehead. Uh, their eyebrows are also arched in shape, and uh, you can see uh, eyebrow hair that connects the two eyebrows, causing a unibrow. Uh, they also tend to have low set ears, a long philthrum, which is mostly because the upper lip is thin, and the, the lips in appearance will have downturned corners, so they'll sort of have this neutral frown. They have mid-face hypoplasia, they tend to have small chins, widely spaced teeth, and about 20% of these children will have a cleft palate. Uh, the extremities are also affected in the NIPBL uh, mutation. CDLS and uh, what you will typically find are uh, lack of some fingers uh, or you can have uh, disproportionately short thumbs which will usually be proximally placed. Uh, they can have small hands and feet, clinodactyly, upper extremity malformations. GI, it's GERD that is going to affect the majority of these patients even as possibly as, possibly as early on as infancy. Uh, they also are at risk for pyloric stenosis, congenital diaphragmatic hernia, which should be evident on birth. Uh, you'll see the scaphoid abdomen and respiratory distress. Another thing I didn't put on here, uh, they are also at increased risk for malrotation and also at increased risk for volvulus. Urogenitally, they do have a tendency towards uh, micropenis and small labia majora and also hypospadias in males. Males also uh, are at increased risk for cryptorchidism. Uh, there can be diseases of the renal parenchyma, uh, of renal formation, and there can also be vesiculo-uteral reflux. Let's say that slowly. Uh, so vesiculo ureteral reflux, reflux between the bladder and the uh, and the ureters. Okay. Um, now, signs of uh, vesiculo ureteral reflux. I can never say that. Uh, that would be a uh, tendency towards uh, towards bladder infections. So if there are uh, if there are bladder infections, um, especially in boys. Um, then uh, any child with repeated bladder infections, uh, you should uh, definitely get a uh, voiding cyst urethrogram. Neurologic, uh, they do have a tendency towards seizures. Sleep disturbances uh, are, are very prominent in these uh, children, especially as they get older. Uh, they have an increased pain threshold. They also tend to be myopic. Uh, they can have hearing loss. These children should have uh, hearing examinations performed every two to three years. Uh, if you do MRI, uh, sometimes you can see brain matter changes, uh, atrophy of the frontal lobe, uh, hypoplasia of the brainstem and of the cerebellum. Uh, behaviorally, of course, they have intellectual disability. Uh, in most cases, self-injurious behavior may be noted. Uh, they have, they tend to have uh, ADD with or without hyper, uh, hyperactivity, uh, depression, and autistic features. All right, so that is a lot of features. What I want you to focus on, though, are the craniofacial features um, and also the fact that they uh, have a tendency towards GERD uh, and the, that the extremities are affected, the upper extremities are affected. So this is a great example of a child with Cornelia de Lange syndrome. You notice the high arch of the, uh, of the eyebrows here, uh, the hair on the forehead, lots and lots and lots of hair. This baby has lots of hair. This is way more hair than you would expect in a baby. Remember, babies usually come out with maybe a little tuft of hair, sometimes bald, uh, but this baby has lots of hair. And uh, these high arched eyebrows are a very, uh, uh, not necessarily a characteristic feature, but uh, it is something that you'll see in uh, the vast majority of cases. Uh, very long uh, philthrum, uh, and the upper lip is small. The chin is also quite small as well. And then, of course, you notice the upper extremity malformations. Again here, you notice an upper extremity malformation. Uh, this baby's chin is a little bit uh, bigger than the other baby, uh, but the ears are low and malrotated. 
Uh, you also notice a larger bilthrum, the downturned lips, and the arched eyebrows. You can kind of see a Sinophorus here. So this child is a little bit older. You see the uh, Sinophorus. Uh, you see the long, uh, long uh, philthrum, and then the uh, downturned uh, lips. Might be low set ears here too. It's kind of hard to tell from this angle. So this child has the widely spaced teeth. Uh, they, he also has the uh, sort of, I can't really tell if he's scowling or not, but it appears that he's got the downturned uh, lips, longer philthrum, flat, na uh, flat nasal bridge, uh, again, very arched eyebrows. And then his ears are pretty low set too. So this young lady uh, has, uh, again, the widely spaced teeth. Uh, the rest of the facial features become a little less distinct as they get older. Um, but she does have uh, the arched eyebrows, too. Her extremities look pretty normal, uh, but her thumb is a little bit lowly placed, uh, proximally placed thumb. This young man has a Sinophorus again here. You can see uh, sort of the uh, downward uh, pointed lips. Uh, he also has low set ears and very obvious upper extremity malformations. And this woman here has, again, all your typical features that you would see, but you notice that the features become a little less obvious as they get older, uh, but that Sinophorus will, uh, will remain. And of course, they can always shave that off, so you don't always see it, but it will grow there. So as they develop, of course, they're going to develop slower and have delayed milestones, both due to the fact that uh, they typically have physical defects, um, but they also are delayed cognitively, and that can uh, uh, affect things as well. Uh, their physical ability may be affected by limb anomalies. There's risk for joint contractures, hip com complications, and scoliosis as they get older. Cognitively, the vast majority will suffer from at least a mild intellectual disability. Oftentimes there's autistic features, ADD, occasionally self-mutilating behavior. Those can interfere with school performance. These children are gonna need special education. Uh, they're going to need individualized educational programs, and they're also going to need uh, physical and occupational therapy to help them function uh, as children and as adults. Socially, it's only really affected by their cognitive limitations. Uh, however, the autistic features may manifest uh, uh, with social isolation. Presumptive diagnosis can be made clinically based on the very characteristic facial features, the upper extremity uh, uh, abnormalities, and the history and physical exam. Uh, genetic testing can confirm the diagnosis and indeed should be done to confirm the diagnosis because this is rather rare. Uh, but for the most part, you can suspect this based on clinical findings. The initial management, of course, is going to be to assess and address any acute surgical issues, uh, namely congenital diaphragmatic hernia and complications thereof. Uh, these children are at risk for uh, atrial and ventricular septal defect, so you should perform a screening cardio uh, echocardiogram on all of these uh, children. They should also get a renal ultrasound because of the risk for renal malformations. Upper GI series is typically performed uh, to look for uh, possible malrotation. Uh, upper endoscopy or pH placement uh, should be placed to uh, evaluate these children for GERD, uh, pH monitor placement. Uh, these children should also have a consult with Peds Ophthalmology and a hearing screening. <coughs> hearing screenings are done in the U.S. universally uh, at birth. However, these children are going to need to go on to have a hearing screening every two to three years. Parents should be educated regarding the signs of volvulus. So uh, that's going to be vomiting, difficulty feeding beyond what's, uh, what's usual. This is an acute issue. Uh, abdominal distension, tenderness, uh, and uh, lack of stooling. Ongoing management is going to be to follow growth and development. Generally, this is done in consort with a developmental pediatrician who specializes in the development of children uh, with these uh, issues. Cryptorchidism, if it's present, should be repaired by 18 months of age or earlier if present. Pediatric dentistry uh, will be on top of these patients because they tend to have issues with malocclusion. Uh, they'll need physical therapy and occupational therapy uh, to help them with functioning. 
individualized educational plans once they get into school, and then genetic counseling, uh, both for the parents, because in some cases there can be a balanced translocation that can lead to this syndrome in very rare cases, and also for the individual, uh, as they're going to need to be aware of uh, what their risk is uh, if they reproduce. In the long term, as for any patient with intellectual disabilities, they should be evaluated and trained as appropriate for a job. However, you need to keep safety in mind. Uh, these uh, patients, uh, the ones that have mild intellectual disability, uh, most of them are able to keep a, a low-skilled job. Uh, however, uh, they'll need evaluation for that um, as far as whether or not they can keep safe. Adult issues primarily stem around uh, the reflux disease as well as the dental problems, uh, the continued risk of volvulus, and then the uh, psychiatric issues. Uh, therefore, uh, these patients should be regularly followed up, um, continuing a multidisciplinary approach, uh, and uh, that will be useful for optimal care. If you have any questions, go ahead and write me a comment below, and I will see you next time.